The objectives of my presentation are twofold. First of all, to emphasize the factors which shaped the perceptions and the attitudes of the West towards the violent breakup of former Yugoslavia. Now, to this end, uh, the presentation will observe and analyze how the mixed reactions and inconsistent reactions of the European states and the United States of America regarding the war in Bosnia were modified in the case of Kosovo. So basically, I will follow on a shift from the Bosnian war to the Kosovo war, trying to identify ideational factors which marked such a shift. Second of all, I would like to investigate how the discourse centered on the so-called inescapable violence between Bosnian Serbs, Bosnian Croats, and Bosnian Muslims was marked by a shift toward arguments built on the responsibility to protect of the West and to stop ethnic cleansing in Kosovo. The main argument defended in this paper and also the research questions will be presented immediately. So the main research question aims at identifying and explaining the factors which triggered the shift in American and European attitudes and the reactions to the violence in Kosovo. So basically, I will examine the shift from a hesitant, inconsistent, and uh, uh, ambivalent attitude of the transatlantic world to the, with respect to the war in Bosnia towards a rather more proactive military response to the war in Kosovo, built on the criteria of just war, and also on the need to use force in order to pursue humanitarian outcomes. So the war in Bosnia, one major construction, one major construction on the breakup of Yugoslavia was intimately linked uh, to, or, and, or in, interwined with the idea of bloody inevitable Balkan wars, uh, of, an escapable, of an inescapable inter-ethnic age-old hatred, which allegedly is such a strong specificity to the Balkan to the Balkan area or to the Balkans, that no solution from outside could put an end to it. Such a construction was shaped through political discourses and media portrayals of a so-called Bosnian or Balkan war, um, Bal Balkan war, uh, and such a Balkan war was waged among three equally intransigent ethnic groups. The latter replaced the more accurate description of the violence as one perpetrated by local extremist groups against the civilian population. <coughs> so the prevailing, in this way, the prevailing discursive construction was based upon the idea that the violence in Bosnia is inherently framed within the historical Balkan predisposition to ethnic strife and therefore cannot easily be solved from, what, from outside. Basically, the international community's perceptions on the war of Bosnia indicated an archetypal example of ethnic violence characterized by rivalries among the three ethnic groups fighting against each other, each equally to be blamed, and not an not as a deliberate ethnic cleansing or genocide committed against civilians belonging to specific communities. This is exactly what Mary Caldor emphasized, and she said that there was a great misunderstanding of the nature and dynamic of the violence in Bosnia, and in the end, the international community, according to Mary Caldor, fell into the nationalist trap. Okay, so in this sense, what could the West do if three equally to be blamed people caught up in violence, and this is yet again another episode, what could the West do? Okay, uh, this interpretation of the Bosnian war was included in several political discourses and in media accounts. And I just offer some brief examples. For instance, American President George Bush argued that the collapse of communism has, open, has thrown open a Pandora's box of ancient, of ancient ethnic hatreds, resentment, and even revenge, while, for instance, Senator McCain described the Bosnian violence in terms of a conflict which had been going on in the Balkans for hundreds of years. 
So, in this sense, the perception was centered on the idea that the three communities were predestined to confrontation, as if there is endemic violence in the Balkans. According to Lene Hansen, these explanations amounted to a so-called Balkan discourse, which articulated the nature and dynamic of the conflict in Bosnia as a Balkan war driven by violence, barbarism, and ancient intra-Balkan hatred stretching back hundreds of years ago. Numerous speeches, actually, accounts, media portrayals, discursive representations of events in Bosnia and Herzegovina stand as testimony for such a geographic construction predisposed to, to endemic violence. I just mentioned, I just selected two such accounts or two such portrayals. For instance, Warren Zimmerman, the last American ambassador to Yugoslavia, believed that the bloody conflicts accompanying the breakup of Yugoslavia were a throwback to the ancient bandit traditions of the Balkans. <coughs> While, at the same time, David Anderson, another former US ambassador to Yugoslavia, said that the problem, I fear, is the Yugoslav themselves. They are a perverse group of folks, never a near tribal in their behavior, suspicious of each other with good, reader, with good reason. So how can we actually offer them reconciliation. So the, the, objective, the objective of this paper is to examine the shift from a hesitant, inconsistent, ambivalent attitude of the trans transatlantic world with respect to the war in Bosnia towards a rather proactive military response to the war in Kosovo. And such the latter response was built on just war criteria and on the need to use force in order to pursue humanitarian grounds, uh, humanitarian outcomes or results. So the argument defended here is that a great part of the transatlantic discursive construction aimed at justifying use of force against Milosevic in order to stop atrocities in Kosovo was built on the idea of failure in Bosnia and the derivative need to not repeat past mistakes in the Balkans yet again, and this was the case of Kosovo. In the case of Kosovo, uh, humanitarian imperatives in Kosovo and the need to promote human rights actually prevailed. So we have, I just selected a few um, speeches and also media portrayals to see the major shift. For instance, according to to Jonathan Steele, the images of 100,000 Albanian refugees leaving Dekani in Kosovo shocked the Blair government. Prime Minister Tony Blair and Foreign Minister Robin Cook were the key actors who argued that Britain and the Alliance had to be prepared to use force to stop Serbian ethnic cleansing in Kosovo. One major transformation here is that, uh, in, in contrast to the case of Bosnia, we no longer deal with three equally to be blamed communities, but there is a clear separation between the perpetrators and those who suffer, the civilians. As far as Germany is concerned, this is the most interesting shift in foreign policy, which this, is, this came from Germany. Until NATO's Operation Allied Force in 1999, German involvement had been reduced to peace building activities and post-conflict humanitarian assistance projects. Germany had contributed with peacekeeping troops in Bosnia. That's true. But actually, such a contribution, contribution was so different to the massive engagement in NATO's peace enforcement operation in 1999. According to commentators, actually, Kosovo marks the first time since World War II that the Bundeswehr used offensive tactic, tactics in the context of the NATO bombing to end the atrocities the Serbian forces were committing against Albanians in Kosovo, and Germany's, Germany's role in the Kosovo war laid the foundation for a new age of German military policy. In what follows, I will try to identify some factors that triggered such a new thinking. 
The shift is also noteworthy because it proceeded from decisions taken by the coalition government of the SPD and the Greens, and both Gerhard Schroeder and Joska, Joska Fischer actually came from a long tradition of pacifism, and according to Brent Steele and other scholars, the alliance was constituted by traditional pacifist elements which stemmed from German guilt over the Second World War. So, for instance, during an interview with a crew from the, Der Spiegel, Schroeder was asked whether one can send German troops in regions in which Germans in the Second World War raged cruelly. Actually, is this justified since the Yugoslavs suffered during the German occupation during the Second World War? And um, the Chancellor replied, our past in which we intervened for the wrong political goals orders for me to do orders for me that we do not stand apart if others occur for the correct goals. Therefore, the main justification for this shift and the, for the use of force was built on humanitarian grounds and on a needed response to atrocities. Schroeder stated that especially we the Germans who have brought guilt, guilt onto ourselves in our history and suffered under murderous dictatorial regimes, we must never again allow murder, expulsions, and deportations to be tolerated by politicians. Now, the main argument here is that uh, what the major defining shift from Bosnia to Kosovo is actually overcoming misachievements in Bosnia and compensating with intervention in Kosovo. One major explanation for the use of force against Milosevic and immediate military action in the Kosovo war, in contrast to the delayed and hesitant reaction to the Bosnian war, was the need to right the wrongs and shortcomings in Bosnia and to prevent another failure to stop violence which in Bosnia was in the end, well, too late. It took three years for violence to be ended and three years of human suffering. So, okay, I'm sorry. So, uh, the point I want to, trust, to, to, to enhance, to, to stress here is that the transatlantic consensus over the, there is a transatlantic consensus over the following ideas. First of all, the international community represented by USA, Great Britain, Germany, and France, was adamant to not bystand another genocidal episode, episode in the Balkans, uh, to not tolerate another humanitarian crisis, and to undertake immediate unwavering action in the case of Kosovo. Second of all, in contrast to the reaction towards the Bosnian war, in the case of Kosovo, there was another point of tran transatlantic convergence. Neutrality, which actually, which actually was not at all functional in the case of Bosnia. So neutrality was no longer the adequate attitude. It was given up and pinpointing to the aggressors, namely Mil Milosevic and the Serb security forces, and separating them from the victims was needed in order to not repeat past mistakes. So the idea of coping with past failures, failures in Bosnia and compensating them with unflinching action in Kosovo was echoed in both American and European discursive constructions. There are just a few examples here. In the case of the United States of America, for instance, Pre President Clinton argued that the world had stood aside as Milosevic had committed genocide in the heart of Europe against the Bosnian Muslims, and this, could be, and this could not be allowed to happen in Kosovo since it's our values. Blaming the international community for the failure in Bosnia, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright said that we believe that in 1991, the international community stood by and watched ethnic cleansing. We do not want that to happen again this time. So the United States of America underlined the moral responsibility of the West to stop atrocities in Kosovo, and Clinton and Albright stressed this many times, actually. According to scholars such as Brent Steele, 
The USA acted as a haunted hegemon, a hegemon haunted by the past, now eager to redress or right the wrongs. And uh, so, the, as a haunted hegemon, trying to overcome past failures and shameful memories. And this is where, where I will extend the argument by saying that shame and guilt, most in this case, played a huge role in designing an immediate response to, to the case of Kosovo. And also, usually, emotions such as guilt and shame play a major role in foreign policy, in designing foreign, foreign policies. Five minutes to go. Five minutes. Thank you. OK, the same, the same theme built on the moral responsibility to not allow violence in Bosnia um, to be repeated was embedded in European discursive constructions. Right. Uh, British foreign, uh, foreign Secretary Robin Cook emphasized the need to pinpoint to the aggressors in order to not repeat past mistakes. We cannot allow, I quote, we cannot allow the same tragedy to be repeated against in Kosovo. Tony Blair also explained the need for immediate action in Kosovo by showing that we know from bitter experience throughout this century, most recently in Bosnia, that inaction or delayed response endangers European security. As far as Germany was concerned, many scholars analyzed German involvement in the Kosovo War in terms of German shame or German guilt, this was Brent Steele, or in terms of Balkan Wars as German trauma, this was Bodo Weber. According to Brent Steele, German involvement in the Kosovo War should be understood in terms of shame, and this is produced by actions uh, which contradict self-identity of states. Reconciling with the German traumatic past entailed full commitment to ending human suffering in Kosovo. Also, it triggered Germany's immediate act and active participation immediate and active participation in NATO's efforts towards this goal. The theme of coping with misachievements in Bosnia and compensating with intervention in Kosovo was also embedded in the German pro-interventionist discourse. As noted by Bodo Weber, for instance, it was Joschka Fischer who compared Srebrenica to Auschwitz in 1995, and four years later, he again made use of Germany's historical baggage to justify intervention in Kosovo. It was also Joschka Fischer who on the eve of NATO's air campaign against Belgrade underlined that this time the humanitarian intervention aimed straight at the perpetrators. Finally, France had a similar attitude, so France's approach on the intervention in Kosovo also echoed past mistakes in Bosnia and the need to not repeat them. We could not, according to, to Lionel Jospin, we could not consent to being stunned witnesses of the preparation of fresh massacres. Vukovar, Srebrenica, and Sarajevo. To that list of martyred cities, we could not just st stand idly and watch the addition of Pristina, Klina, and others. So, in conclusion, in this text, in this presentation, I tried to identify three main factors that shape the shift in the transatlantic perceptions on the wars of uh, former Yugoslavia. And uh, actually, the question was, what changed from Bosnia to Kosovo? And I identified three explanations. So shift, first shift is actually the one from war occurring in an age-old ethnic conflict-trapped territory, as Bosnia was portrayed, towards a war and humanitarian catastrophe at the heart of Europe in the case of Kosovo. And this, these were the words of Clinton, of Bill Clinton. Shift number two, from the equivalence of guilt, and this was termed as such by Tom Gallagher, in the case of Bosnia, towards the imperative of identifying and targeting aggressors. Again, Milosevic and the Serb security forces in the case of Kosovo. Shift number three, from deployment of ground troops and neutrality, a neutral peacekeeping, the United Nations Protection Force, in the case of Bosnia, towards airstrikes and peace, enforce peace enforcement. So it is my claim and conclusion that the idea of Balkan violence in the case of Bosnia was changed and another shared understanding within the transatlantic dialogue ensued in the case of 
Kosovo, and the latter was centered on atrocities against civilians. Finally, in contrast to Bosnia, which was portrayed by some as part of an age-old violent territory, Kosovo was described as part of the heart of Europe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hatza.